Hi everyone, my name is Chuck Becking, and um, my uh, I've been in the idempier idempier uh, compier community for some time. I think my first uh, class with your Yankee was in 2003, so I've got lots of battle scars and inexperience to, to share with what not to do. That's good. Um, if I speak too quickly, uh, which I tend to do, please tell me to slow down. I will gladly do so. Um, the purpose of today's discussion is to talk about environment management. So when I first started, I was desperate for someone to sort of guide me through the process. And so this presentation is, is to everyone who's new to IDEMPIER. Um, if you have a question, please don't hesitate to ask because it's important that you do, whether it be inside this presentation or after the fact. The second thing is, I know that there are some things or many things that I do that are incorrect. So for those of you who've been doing this longer than I have and are better at it than I am, please let me know on ideas that you have or, or things that you do to share. So for, for those who are beginning, please uh, understand the concepts and ask questions. For those who are advanced, please help me understand how I can do this better. So I drew a diagram that talks about the sort of the life cycle as you go live. And I think go live is oftentimes where environment management really plays a big role. Secondarily, when you have uh, uh, the upgrade process. So when you're first playing with IDEMPIER, you end up with this throwaway environment. And, and if you're me, you throw away tons of environments before you get anything meaningful out of IDEMPIER, at least when you first get started. But at some point, your customer decides, hey, this thing IDEMPIER is pretty cool. I want, I want to pursue it. So what I typically do is I start with what's called a pristine environment. Pristine uh, is, so I'm gonna go over a couple of vocabulary words to make sure we're on the same page to make sure those vocabulary words make sense. Um, I use two different names, pristine and test. Both of these environments above are pre-go life. And then once you go live, I use two different terms, production and sandbox. And sandbox is where you just go play and test and do stuff. And there's all kinds of ways that you can refer to a sandbox. You can have UAT, you can have stage, but I'm gonna collectively refer to all these as a sandbox. Is that okay? One other quick comment before we go into it is I wanna talk about uh, virtualization. Now, in my mind, in my opinion, virtualization is critically important. I don't think you should install IDEMPIER on, on, on bare metal, because one, you don't need to, and virtualization gives you so many benefits. Two, I don't care which virtualization you use, whether it be Docker or VirtualBox or VMware. To me, they're, they're largely the same um, in it, when it comes to the concepts of, the, of what we want to talk about today. All right, so Pristine. Pristine is an environment you're not live yet. You have your core team who are in a room meeting all the time, working your way through the goal life process. It's typically me, the technical lead, the accounting lead, and the operations lead. So there's four people, right? You are the, the power people in the room, and you know IDEMPIER, and you know where you are in the process. Typically, only those four people have access to Pristine, and Pristine is the holder of all data that's been um, blessed or certified or approved, right? That in turn, that includes your application dictionary changes for things that you know to be working, and it includes your client data, business partners and products. So very few people have access to this environment. Now that environment is purposely made small because it's typically only supports one or two concurrent users, right? Then you have this test environment, and your test environment is what you're going to deploy on eventually. So it needs to be larger. So if you have a clustered environment, your test environment is, is clustered. Um, it, for me, almost always my database is separate from my application servers. I may have multiple application servers behind a, a load balancer. Is that right? And I have scripts that basically, on, a, on the press of a keystroke, they'll basically take that, data, that entire system not just the database, but the entire system. So basically what it does, in short, is it does, there's a script that does a, a backup, which stuffs the data inside opt IDEMPIER server data. And then it takes the entire IDEMPIER, IDEMPIER directory, tars it up, and there's a script here that goes and grabs it, 
and sticks it in this environment. So I basically wipe out the identifier folder, replace it from pristine. So all that was is now completely gone, and all that's ready for testing is a, is a picture of pristine, plus the scripts that go and disable some features like emailing. You don't want to email customers in your test environment. Is that right? Now, the thing that I love about this is that you're going to do this over and over and over and over, right? Every time you bring someone into a room to test, every single time a developer goes and, and tests some, some feature, that's, a simply, that's essentially your go-live process, right? Except for the day that you go live, you don't run the cleaning scripts. It just magically exists. Now, there's two concepts here. One, in the go-live, you're going to fail. The question is, have you planned to fail? Because failing is a good thing. I fail all the time. Importing business partners, ah, disaster, right? Importing uh, open invoices, it's, it's a dance, right? But by the time you get to the day you go live, you've done it so many times that the people in the room say, oh, for the love of goodness, if we don't go live, I'm gonna kill somebody. The point being is that you have some degree of, of, of confidence. So even though there's a line that connects these two, these are basically the same box. They just get, it's get, re, get renamed from test to production. And then those same cleaning scripts basically uh, swap roles where, to Carlos's point, keeping all the environments in sync is, is a, can be a challenge. And for me, I use that same process that tars up the identifier directory and I push it and I use it all the time. I basically am constantly broadcasting, here's the current database, please use it, or the current identifier. And the benefit of that tarring up the identifier directory is that there's no ambiguity as to what environment has what plugin or has what behavior. It should be an exact mirror. So any questions about what we have so far? <clears throat> I want, so I operate in an environment where I write almost no code. I'm a terribly slow de developer. Um, I review most of the code that goes in, or at least a, lot, a good percentage of it, but I, I, I don't write code. So Deepak and a handful of others do the majority of the development. I create a ticket, they, they execute the tickets. The way that I operate is that almost never do I allow developers to have access to the production system. And it's not because I don't trust Deepak or Logilite or, or anybody like that. I think there are inherently different interests in this process. Developers are incentivized in a certain way, uh, and they're inclined to do things in a certain way. DevOps, the ones who are really in charge of production, definitely have a different mindset and value different things. And so when you create that, that, that separation, you let the right people do the right tasks. The thing that's, I think, critical here is that the fact that Idempier is capable of supporting that is incredible. That's a big deal, right? To have the developer tools where you can successfully, over many years, over many version, support that environment is, is a huge benefit. So thank you for everyone who, all the, the sweat and effort that's gone into that. All right. The next thing I want to talk about is a typical environment. So we've gone through the evaluation process, we've gone through the mock go lives and all the scenario testing, the, the system is now live and it's working well. What does a typical live system look like? For me, this is three out of five times what I typically use. I have an HA proxy load balancing, uh, multiple web UIs. Three are typically the minimum. I don't think I've ever gone above four. And then I have a services application server that's not behind the, the HA proxy. And this is the one that's nominated to run all your processes, your accounting engine and stuff like that. When you go to do a release, so for me, the way I do it is a release is in itself a ticket. And of course, it's just a pointer to a bunch of other tickets. Um, and all the developer artifacts that go along with it, the pack-ins and the scripts and the, and the jars. And for me, 
Well, so when I do a deployment, I only do the deployment on the services app server. So that's where all the configuration is done. I can take that guy down uh, without disrupting in any of the service, do what I need to do to it, and when it comes back up, or when, it, as it, when I'm done with the, the, the deployment, it represents the newest code, the newest states. Now, granted, this guy will touch the database, and there are some scenarios where that could create issues, data integrity issues, and you have to be aware of that. But the vast majority of time, that won't happen, just by nature of the changes that we typically make. So once my deployment is done on my services app server, then I will typically bring down one or two, typically two to begin with, and I will run that same script I talked about before. It's actually slightly modified. It's a web UI restore as opposed to a, a restore all. And I, may, I do that same clone process. Cool? So basically, copy the MPR server, stick it here, stick it here, bring these two back up, bring this down, do the third, and at this point, it's up. Now, if, if you're doing this during business hours, users are guaranteed to be kicked out at least once, right? Preferably once. But that's the greatest disruption to that process. If you do it off hours, it's a tree falling in a forest. No harm, no foul. One point I want to make is that the app server, the, the application server that's considered services, that one's a pretty important server, right? It's the seed for, for all the rest of the web UIs. The web UI servers have almost nothing of value on them. They're virtually stateless. And the only thing you really want from them are their logs. Now, I don't do a very good job of, of, of aggregating logs. One of the things that makes it challenging is because Idempier rotates logs, you have to, there, there are log feeders that if it's a single file, it's pretty simple. You just send it to um, some sort of syslog. If it's a folder, it becomes more challenging, but there are tools out there. I think I have a couple references in the ERP Academy that can take an entire folder and push them to a, to a log server. But outside of the log server, there's nothing on here that has any state. Now, there's an asterisk on that, on that comment, cache, right, is the one thing that exists that is, that is stateful. Is there anything else that you guys can think of that I'm not thinking of? So, I'm excited to see what Hinsing Lao is, is developing. Up until now, these operate autonomously. In my experience, that's okay. The number of times that you need to reset the cache in production is, is very slim. So the fact that you have to go to multiple ones or you write a quick script that just does a call into, iterates them and it calls a, a cache reset, is not that big a deal. The only time that I've ever found where these having separate caches is an issue is when a user deletes a record. So when you delete a record, it removes it from cache. And so that potentially could cause some integrity issues a tax rate, a period, and those are bad examples, you wouldn't delete those, but updating them, for example. So, any questions, comments? Yes, sir. Okay, so the one URL that all users would connect to is tied to the load balancer. In my case, it's HA proxy. And so this would be Chuck at, or this would be dub 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 at my app name, you know, tsunami, whatever, dot com. And then this guy would have uh, services at dot whatever the URL is. So this is a dub 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 okay. URL, and that's a services dot. Private. Agreed. It should not be accessible. So you ask the you ask the question. If I understand it correctly, you ask the question. Hey, what's the difference between this one and this one from an end user perspective? And the difference is this is the machine. This is the IP address or the URL that everyone sees. 
and to Carlos's point, only special people get access to the server. And it has a different DNS or a different name. Does that answer your question? There are, the, the purpose is, it's a great question. So, <sighs> hmm? yeah, so when you have, let's, 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 let's digress a little bit and let's talk about, it's going to take me about three minutes to answer your question. So, HA proxy is an example of a web balance, of a, 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 a load balancer. And I use it in a, what's, uh, I think it's called sticky session, right? So the app recreates, some, it's not J session anymore, it's some other session. But this guy monitors which session you're connected to and makes sure that you go back to whatever app server that, whatever web UI server that you were connected to. The value in doing so is that the user only has one URL, not, not between three and that if any one goes down, you may have to re-log in, but it's Im immediately available. So a load balancing environment has its benefits. Um, second comment is, if you have more than one application server, you don't want, so, in the, so the scheduling mechanism exists in the application dictionary. The application dictionary is shared between all servers. And so Idempier has this feature where you can, you can nominate one, uh, or potentially multiple actually, to be the person who runs those schedules. So it, it, in my case, it's nice to have one server who's nominated to run all backend processes. It's just by convention that that one happens to be outside of the load balancer. Um, and it also, by convention, happens to be the one that's sort of the seed or the, the, the master of the group. Kind of, um, you have multiple uh, virtual machines hosting Web UI 1, Web UI 2. Yes. So, okay. So. Yeah. So, I don't know how true this statement is today, but historically, a database is pretty ironclad as it, as it relates to scaling really large with a single instance. Historically, Java wasn't as good. It's gotten much better in recent years. Um, but it's advantageous to be able to potentially have an army of web UIs that can scale. So if, you're in, if you have local hardware, this might not be as big of a benefit. The single biggest benefit is if this guy goes down, only a third of your company pops their heads up. Am I speaking to your point? Yeah, I think you have one company in Frankfurt and one in Paris, and they can make use of this concept. Well, that one, so I wouldn't go, yes, you can, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is just to have a farm that you have redundancy. Uh, and you can you can distribute the load. Yeah, horizontally. Hmm? Scaling horizontally. Scaling horizontally. Yes. So you don't configure a server for 1,000 users. You, you can scale the servers uh, when you need them. Yeah. And that's especially adv advantageous if you're in an environment like AWS or some a hosted environment where during the day you're paying for five servers and at night you're paying for just a, a small number. And then typically I have a DB and I have a, a DB replica um, for reporting and for another a couple of other purposes. Sometimes uh, in, in IDMPR you schedule, schedule the processes, accounting processor, request processor, schedule processes, and you can attach the process to a, an IP address specifically. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And many times this web UI are changing IP, mm -hmm. dynamic IP. 
in the service, you will usually configure with a static IP. So you point all your schedules uh, to the service application, and you don't have problems if, if the web UI go and come back. Yes. I think optionally you could also have an S3 server there for your attachments that get stored on the on a file server in the cloud. Yes. <coughs> yes. In fact, it's, that's actually a great point. Um, as soon as you as soon as you approach this load balanced environment, there are other things you have to consider and a shared mount where your files exist whether it be just a volume that's shared between the th or, uh, between the three or S3 is a, is a, a, a super valid point. Because nothing, so nothing, nothing lives on these servers. They're literally just pulled up from, a, from an image. Any, any plugin that uses a local database, for example, Lucene? Lucene indexing? Lucene, uh-huh. Uses a local database? Well, in, in, my case, in my case, the services runs Lucene. The only Lucene, so the only. Or they go to a database. Everybody is mm -hmm. so no, no local data because no local mm -hmm. data. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, say that question one more time. So, so, th you t so you mentioned the reference to load balancer and l distributing load. But it yeah. Web UI 1 is crashed and load balancer distribute to second. Yes, so Web UI 1, let's say it goes down. So the user who was connected to Web UI 1 had a session ID. This server realizes this is down and now has to point them to another web UI. From a user perspective, they see that their session ended. They got booted out and put back to a login. If they were running a long process, that could potentially be an issue. But if they were just using IDMP or under normal circumstances, the most inconvenient aspect of it is that they have to re-log in to create a new session. Is a method to prevent this? To prevent the UI from crashing? To no. The question is, is there any way uh, to prevent a uh, user from re-logging after the crash or the initial of the UI? It's a great question. Carlos. I don't think so. I have a may I ask a question? Um, so the question is, is there an environment today the, where your session would be shared across the application servers? Does Hazelcast share sessions? No, no, no. We, we, yeah, uh, that's the clustering, yeah? But we don't support. So we, we do sort of in that we, if you use Hazel, if you, if you use it, IDMP uses Hazelcast behind the scenes, period. If you join the service to a single cluster, it'll share the cache, but it won't share sessions. It's, it's, it's the memory share, yeah? Session. Okay. Yeah. And, and for, to, to do clustering? Yeah, yeah. Now, the other question. To do clustering, we will do it through. It is a, it's a complex thing. Technically, because we need to change all Java classes to be serial disabled, yeah? And, and if everything in the system is serial disabled, then you can put in a Hazelcast uh, session, and then <coughs> you have clustering. Clustering means that you can, if the server goes down, you can migrate the session to another server, but we yeah. don't have that. And, well, it and it has a disadvantage because when you do that, there is no original scanning because all sessions will be replicated on every server. Huh. So memory, memory consumption increase, correct? So you restrict like uh, whether you are using one server 
for file server, number of users are safe. And you run the risk of when the system goes down, it goes down for everyone. Whereas here, you have at least some isolation, where if one goes down, only that number, that percentage are affected. Good questions. It's good. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Can you start stop WebUI servers by external language like Ansible or Puppet or something like that? I because I'm playing with the idea of uh, Ansible. It looks me very similar to Bash script, <coughs> but you can uh, use it much more effectively. This is probably my ignorance. I typically stay away from Puppet and, and those type of tools because the experience that I have had is that they tend to, they tend to rot. Um, and most things I can do within Bash. So I, I, I haven't had a need to go beyond it, beyond Bash, and just as simple as service calls to, to be able to, to remote in and, and do the tools that I need to do. Um, I, don't, I, I think that speaks to your point, but I don't think it answers your question. I, ha I have not played with Puppet or, or, or Ansible. Is it, it's Ansible, right? Yeah. We, we, we have used the Ansible to, to do the, the creation of the new servers in, uh, in, in Amazon for, yep. for load, no, that is cloud, for, cloud formation, yeah? Yeah. So you, you can configure in Amazon um, yes. when, uh, when my servers are uh, all busy with a lot of CPU, then start a new server. Mm -hmm. Or my memory is almost gone, then start a new server. Yep. And that uh, you configure with Ansible all the creation of the server, deployment, or copy from the service. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, and the other thing is too. That was the question. Well, the, the other thing too is that I am a much bigger fan of creating an image of creating an image of a server and then deploying the image. Because as it is, I'm, I mean, when this guy comes live, I'm already going to copy over the current. I don't want to have to maintain what is the current standard because that definition is my standard. So when I fire up a new server, its purpose in life is to, to one, come up from an image that already has Java and everything installed on it, right? And it just simply goes and says, grab me, copy down, deploy me, and add me to HA proxy. But um, when we start the, re the upgrade in the middle of the day, sometimes mm -hmm. we need to patch the server or we have problem. Then first, at this moment, we have the bash script. We are sending to each server to bash and so up kill the kill server message. Yep. So they got uh, get a message. Okay, server will be kicked out in three minutes, let's say. But we also need to disable login other users. You want? Why? Because uh, if uh, the shutdown process is running, so waiting, let's say, 15 minutes, then new users, upcoming users, has no information about server will be, will, will be shut down. And this is something I would like to automate with Ansible. So, so if the worst case scenario is that you have, OK, so let's, let's go back to the, the transaction process that you talked about earlier. So if my script says, OK, so I've done my deployment here. You agree? So this guy, this guy is now fully deployed. All my, all my scripts have run, right? I can tell from HA proxy how many users are on each of these servers because it gives a nice little dashboard. Um, I can now see if there's any long running processes, at least as of some microsecond, right? And as long as there are no tra open transactions, I can shut that server down in good confidence. And the only penalty of that is the users who are on that one web UI now you have to log back in. No, or, or, or you configure the proxy to, to not shut down if there are sessions. Well, if, but if you're doing it during the day, you're almost guaranteed to have sessions on there, right? <laughs> Unless the alternative is is that you can. Um, so, if you're an Amazon, you have as many servers as, as you have available to you that you're willing to pay for, right? So, in this environment, let's say I have three. I can actually update my app server. I can fire up three new images, bring all the three of these up to speed, right? 
and then over time, I'll uh, let these die naturally. That's not as clean to me because I, I, I don't like having two versions of the code out there. But in the modern day world, that happens fairly, fairly commonly. And again, you'll know if your release has a potential compromise when some are on the old system and some are on the new system. Does that also work for reserved instance where you pay sort of like for a reserved amount of CPUs? Amazon reserved instance? Sure, absolutely. Because yeah. again, you're coming from an image. It goes and grabs its current, its current snapshot. And yeah, and it joins itself to the, to the, pro to the load balancer. Absolutely. I mean, from a, from a cost perspective, also, I mean, from a cost perspective, yeah. if, you, if you create new servers and eliminate the old ones all the time, Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. hey, it's, it's an application of the same concept. Do you agree? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the question was, if you have, if you use AWS as reserved instances, mm -hmm. reserved instances are a reduced price mm -hmm. based on surplus availability inside AWS. Mm -hmm. Oh, Chuck, another one. Uh, in regards to the server specs for this for this environment here, do you have a best practice kind of like? thing that says, you know, if you have 100 concurrent users or 50, whatever, yeah. this should be the spec, you know, that you're looking at if you're running an environment. Okay. So, yes, and I'm in, I'm in a room full of people smarter than me, so I, w I want to ask everybody. Um, Idempier, the dominant feature of Idempier is that it's memory intensive, right? If you think about, if you look at just the bookkeeping that it does when you open one window, right, uh, and scale that across, you know, it, 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 my experience from a budget standpoint is you budget 300 meg per concurrent user. In my experience, the application server um, puts much less load on the cores than it does on memory. I have had environments where I did run out of cores, but it was, t so, so if you're, if you're hosting inside a company, cores are an, a, a somewhat of a moot point because you can buy these mega machines, right, that have these massive amounts of cores and to throw 16 cores at a, a web UI is not that hard. In Amazon, cores are expensive. Remember, well, everything's expensive in Amazon. Um, but an extra large, for example, that has four cores typically serves me well. So, so the average web UI that I create has four cores. So 300 meg per user, four cores. Now, so Java has this thing called the heap, and it's the bane of my existence. Um, the great thing about Java is it has the heap. The bad part about Java is it has a heap. And of course, the stack and the heap, the stack is this fixed structure, the heap is for every, everything else gets put on, right? Um, so that, I'd like, to, I'd like to go on a tangent, if you guys don't mind, to talk about heap, and, and heap management and environment management. Is that okay? All right, so there are two tools that I, that I recommend. So, JProfiler is a paid tool. It's amazing. It's, I, I tried to use uh, uh, the JConsole. I, I spent an entire like, two days trying to get the open source tools to work. And I did in 10 minutes what it took me two days on the open source tools. It's like 800, it's like 600 bucks. It connects to a remote instance. It tells you what, what, your, what your footprint is on a remote instance, including being able to connect to a, a production server. It'll give you the total heap uh, use and it'll do it down by class. It is the best tool that I have found at debugging memory issues. JCMD is a free tool. It comes with, with, with Java. And if you look at my installation script in the utils directory, there's actually, um, uh, I think it's in the utils. I've, I basically have a bash script that will connect and report on the memory. Because um, you want to know, there's nothing that's obvious about whether a server is about to run out of heat memory. There's no, there's no warning flags. There's some monitoring tools out there. But the other thing you have to be careful of, too, is that Connecting to a JVM and asking for its current heap is an expensive process. You don't want to do it once a second. You'd really do it like once every couple of minutes. So in my experience, your web UI servers, um, I set XMS and XMX to the same value, and I set it to about 75% of the total memory of the machine, assuming that I have an environment where 
all it does is run a web UI. And it may be 80%. So, and that can go as high as you want. I think where Java runs into, so the Java heap management changes from version to version. The last time I did any kind of real research on it was in Java 8. Um, and in Java 8, if you go beyond 32, meg, 32 gig in memory, there's something that happens that basically reduces your effective memory uh, availability. Um, so up to 32 gig is, is a reasonable and practical amount for this. I think it's 32 gig. I can't remember for sure. Does that speak to your point? Yeah, very much. Yes, sir? Uh, I did not um, understand my Every pr every process that's run on a schedule yeah. is run inside the services app. Yes. One other quick comment too. And this is sort of an unknown feature. There's this feature called task. Who in here has ever heard of task? Yeah. So basically. Idempier has this window called task, and you basically, it's a tool for you to go in and run uh, an OS level command, right? Well, if all your, uh, a script, right? Well, if all your scripts exist inside the services app and you're replicating that one directory inside here, all of them have access to what the, what's currently released. And so you can run a task, whether it be on a, so okay, so one, task right now is a second class citizen, right? Because, yeah, yeah, and it has it has some it has some stability issues. Um, what Deepak did for me, or Logilite, is they made it where you can you can I have a, a shell of a process whose purpose is to execute a task. It does so um, more a little more gracefully, and it's now available everywhere you can run a process on a scheduler and all kinds of stuff. So ideally. Like, it's easy to go create a cron job to go do maintenance stuff, right? And it's easy, it's, it's, it, it, and even with, from the user experience standpoint, like, since I don't write any code, it's sort of a leap for me to go and say, I want to tick it and, do, and go. Sometimes I just want to script it, right? Well, if you use this thing called task, and your scripts that you're automating are inside your app server, then your, your tasks are now available everywhere. Like if I, and the, the single biggest reason I use tasks are to manage um, materialized views. Right? There are times I want to give users the ability to materialize, to refresh a view, because there's some really heavy uh, project analysis budget versus actual, right? As an example, it's scheduled to refresh at 8 in the morning and three, 2 in the afternoon, and I want them to be able to go refresh it myself. So, task. And task is scalable because it fits that environment. Um, so, I want to talk about upgrades next. So, I'm a believe so two things, two a couple quick comments. One, I typically upgrade a customer every two years. Most of my customers have between 15 and 100 plugins. I'm a big fan of keeping your plugins as simple as possible. And to give you an example, if you're deploying, uh, if you're using um, the interface uh, I model. I model, I model factory, right? Every I model factory that we put will will go into a plugin. Now, you got to be careful because sometimes you can create circular references, and sometimes you have to group stuff together, like in manufacturing, right? If you have a route and you have a bill, those logically need to be together because otherwise you'll end up with circular dependencies. So I have these customers who have this large volume of of plugins. Now, from a DevOps standpoint, I love it because if I ever go to review code, my life is easy. And my plugins reference each other, and they can reference my version, so therefore I can have some idea as to what, what's the contract between the, the plugins. The pain and the tail part of that is when you go to do an upgrade. Now, I run on Ubuntu's LTS, so if I have a customer who's running 16.04, when I go to do that next release, I'm gonna put them on the current LTS, which means that this entire environment is now replicated down here Right? It's staged. Right? So I have the current production environment. It's on 16.04. I have another version of that. It's now on 18.04. And I've now got to go move all my plug. Uh, the database part of it's easy. You just move the database over, run the migration scripts, and that part's good. 
The plugin department, the plugin part of it is difficult for two reasons. One, if any of your plugins overwrite core code, you have to do all this validation. Uh, and then two, you know, when you change, so when you do your switch from 1604 to 1804, you're changing Postgre versions, you're changing Java, right? Sometimes that, that oftentimes will break plugins, PUI being the perfect example. Um, and so now I have this go live process all over again. I have a group of users, they're doing UAT. The pristine concept's a little different. I mean, but for all practical purposes, this entire environment will get shut down the day this other 1804 environment goes live. So an application server should never live more than two years in my environment. Which, you know, it gets you away from the whole, if you've ever been in a situation where you go to reboot a server and you find yourself saying a prayer before, before you do it, you know you're, you're in a bad state. And that environment helps prevent that scenario. So, anything else? Are you, uh, yes, sir. Comments on something you said about the Hazel cache and uh, when I use the leader record. Yes, sir. The, that that uh, also works in, in multiple nodes uh, because of Hazelcast. Mm -hmm. But we have two ways to, to use Hazelcast. One is uh, distributed cache, but we almost don't use that. There are maybe four or five tables with very few records that we, we cache distributed. Yeah? Okay. Because in our test, uh, the distributed <coughs> is extensive in network time and memory, consumes memory everywhere, yeah? but mostly network. We, we, we use Hazelcast, and when you put something in the cache, Hazelcast needs to send the memory to all the nodes on the, on the server, <coughs> and that's network time. Yeah? Um, so we almost don't use distributed cache. Okay. Almost not use that. But <coughs> to solve the problem that the, a user comes and changes, the, the common problem was for was a user comes to a node and close an accounting period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the old, the user in the second node doesn't know and can keep posting documents in a closet. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. That was the original problem that we we, set, we talked and that was in swing times. So somebody closed a period in swing and all the other users didn't know and kept pushing accounting. Mm -hmm. So the mechanism we use is also Hazelcast but not shaded cache. What we use is broadcasting a message to all the servers, telling this record changes. Yeah? Yeah? Yes, sir. So basically, we say delete this record from the cache yep. to all the servers. But only in an environment where you have Hazelcast connected to each other. Yes. And so. When you have this multi, I think it's necessary to. To make a group of the Hazel all the stuff. So, I think this is true, but please correct me. So, one, the default for Hazelcast is broadcast. In AWS, broadcast is not allowed. So, therefore, if you fire up two servers in the same subnet, they won't know each other. You have to purposely configure it. It used to be in 4.1 that if you brought up two servers next to each other, they assumed a joint. And I think we, we changed that where they're assumed not to join, and you have to purposely join them together. Is that correct? <coughs> and you need to, uh, for Amazon, you need to change the Hazel Cast and copy and do some compilation. They recommend to create a role and put the role information to connect there. An IAM role? Uh, and, uh, uh, what role? It is a Hazel Cast configuration. Okay. Do you name a role? And, ah. Uh, all server has the same. Uh, if you don't use UDP, you use TCP. What it's called there in the plugin is a discovery strategy. So you, you put the conditions 
for one node to discover the other nodes. It can be security groups, it can be tags on, on your machines. Okay. And uh, yeah, you need a role to share that information. Yes, sir. But uh, if, if you don't have Hazelcast, that scenario is complete. Mm -hmm. because the, all the servers will, will not now there's someone on the other yes sir <coughs> so that's all that I had scheduled for today so unless you guys have any other questions thank you very much for your time and your attention <coughs> Anton So, I will attempt, and please correct me where I'm wrong. So, one, if I am working with developers, they get a obfuscated version of the database, right? And I periodically make the obfuscated, I peri periodically publish an obfuscated version. The assumption and expectation is, is that you're always on the most recent version of that database export. So these get refreshed constantly. Not constantly. I, well, I have no control over that process. But historically, that's not been an issue. And that's typically, they drive that more than I do. Well, then you're just subject to the normal identity or enterprise tools for, for development, right? So if you have competing pack ends, you can. The, the great thing about a pack end is if, if one steps on another, it'll fail, and it'll fail in its entirety. And you have to, and that's the purpose of stage. So you have developer A, developer B, both of which are operating on something, and it's possible that there's overlap. So when I do a release, I do it ticket-based, which means that that ticket, its whole purpose in life is to be a release, and it points to all the other tickets that are being deployed, right? And so I will never, why? I will almost never deploy something on production where I haven't gone to a stage environment and confirm that my deployment will go perfectly, including detecting the situation that you're referring to. But, I mean, Deepak can speak more accurately than I can. There's a whole group of people who are working on a whole group of tickets. So, rare case if even if it happens, right, when you deploy the staging, uh, what two page will say. So, we have to create two pages, correct, uh, and we know the dependencies. So, then after after staging, correct, whenever you move to the products, and we don't have the issue. Yes, if you're in the same company. Yeah, and, and mostly what we practice. No, wait, wait, wait. wait well, hold on. So, we, if you're in the same, but you, so I don't know if I agree with that statement. You said if you're in the same company. And they collide. So in, the ca in that case, that's exactly right. And so as, as soon as that situation happens, you have to go back to the developer. You, you have to burden one of the developers to go say, OK, you, 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 yeah, go delete this and, re and, and No, Packin pack is amazingly capable, but there are definite areas that it just can't solve the problem. And if two people create the same field where it violates a unique key, it just it can't. And, 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 and they have different UUIDs, it, it can't succeed in that scenario. I think it's similar to code, yeah? If you put two developers to work on the same Java class, at some point of time, you need somebody resolving conflict. Yeah? Very good. So, with what the two-pack automate, the two-pack class is the same, but at some moment, you need to solve conflict with two-pack. Yeah? 
uh, it's, it's uh, common sometimes. No, not common, but what, what I see it happens is two developers create the same object. For example, an element. Yeah? Same name of the element, but in the two developers, the UUID is different. So one of them will say when it was in the two That's a conflict. Same as a Java conflict, but it's in a two So you, you can also limit what is going into the pattern, so only if you really want to change it. And that Packing is not only module or something like that. Mm -hmm. That is not only conflict, means uh, this is easy detectable. Like many times what happens for the same features, two developers create two different things, two different columns, with different names, but purpose is same. Yeah. Correct. But when design, you yeah. you do uh, you review, you have to merge it. You say that okay, this one you don't use, correct your code. And uh, use the one that other door of the escape. So that's all uh, when we do like uh, review anything. Okay. So that's happened. Another, another common scenario I think is that developer A who is working on one ticket, and developer B in another ticket. Yeah? <coughs> and developer B uses an element that created developer A. Yeah? And sometimes the ticket from developer B goes to release before the ticket from A. That fails, and that is detected usually on a stage. If you go to production, it may be too late. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because the two pack will fail because there is a fail. not in the yeah? That's also <coughs> Very important to have a stage if you have uh, the release planning uh, made by separated tickets. The stage is critical for this is only one thing I'm not totally clear. Why is the stage different from the why is the stage different from the UAT? I mean well, the must be the yeah. it's it's the same. Yeah. I, I I, I should have I've put a, I should have put stage up here as well. This represents sort of a category of stuff, and then here's a, I'm calling it out specifically as part of the line of. We, 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 we had a company that had when it says a stage they had like three different servers. Yeah, one is for internal tests, another for user tests, and another for uh, DevOps tests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's a chain. Like but all, the, all that is the same server, just different people doing different tests. Yep. Uh, to the so, to so, sorry, what you're saying is that the stage function could be in the UAT server. Is that what you're saying? <coughs> or is it physically two different? Uh, oh, no, no. It's however you wish. Yeah. But, the, but the, okay. But here's the critical point. You need guarantees that you don't go into the production before you have validated that. Yes. Sure. And the only way I know to do that yeah. is to take a mirror image of this in every way, mm -hmm. stick it on a server, mm -hmm. and then go try. Mm -hmm. Now, there's, there's two, before I leave, there's two quick comments. One, if you're new to Idempier, it's easy to write this conversation off as being really complex. Because a lot of what we talked about was complex. But the core concepts, are relatively easy as far as looking at the di diagram. And if you don't understand them, come talk to me. Because when you start talking to customers that are bigger, they're gonna have questions about this and you need to understand it from a conceptual standpoint. You'll get into the weeds and you know, they'll, you'll find people who'll help you. We'll help you to get past that. The second comment I have is um, <sighs> deploying jars. So the Felix console is a, a little bit of a black box. It's capable, but when you deploy a jar, it takes that jar, I think it actually digitally signs it, sticks it in this obscure place that's embedded somewhere inside opt Idempier server, and I'm not a fan of how it works, mainly because, one, it's a little bit of a black box, you can't see what you have there as far as the jar, but two, because it's JVM sensitive. There are times when in a production environment you need to rev your JVM to support a plugin. If you do that, 
in today's world, you will break every plugin that you have deployed. So I'm working with Deepak, and hopefully with the core team, um, to have a mechanism where I can have a folder. I can, I can have this repository of all my artifacts that I build as far as, as, far as you know, deploying something. I can create a branch which represents a, lease, a, a release. I can have all my jars in that release. I can deploy it to a folder and run a script that goes and deploys the jars. Behind the scenes, what it does is it takes that jar, it puts it in a folder where all the rest of the jars are. It calls into Telnet, says, please deploy this. The jar itself tells, has all the metadata to know what the start level is, right? And so then you have this folder that represents all the jars that have been deployed. Now, you can go into that folder and get rid of the versions that are no longer needed, but it doesn't really matter that much because you can reconcile the list of, of jars with your OSGI SS inventory list. That tells it what version you're currently on. So the goal is to make the release process less manual. The plugin, which I was not aware of, which is fantastic, gives you the ability to now do client side um, plugins, which is awesome. And so the only, and, and, and it includes timestamps. We probably need to include this, the same concept of, of ordering. Um, and the only thing we haven't solved yet is the ability to run specific SQL. I typically don't like putting SQL inside the, the, the pack in, um, but I can get past that so, if that's so an issue. Right. In theory, yes. I agree with that. All right. Any other questions? Thank you very much for your time and your attention. Appreciate it.